Okay, everybody, we're going to get started here on this final uh, session. Before we begin, we're just going to invite Booker Cornea up, the market lead commercial banking from the First Nations Bank of Canada. We're just going to do a quick draw for some AirPods that they had at their booth, so I think if you uh, wrote your name down, you might be a big winner today. Thanks a lot. I just wanted to say thank. Like this is such an amazing event. Um, and just I want to say thanks to Dallas and his team, Melissa. Um, you know the whole C3 group. Um, just an amazing experience. Some amazing networking and connections here. So thank you. So this is a you got to be here to win situation. All right, Dwayne Henning. VP of Operations for IPAC. <laughs> Dwayne, are you here? Going once, going twice, gone. Sorry, Dwayne. <laughs> All right, Dan Baker, Chair of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Dan, are you here? I need some AirPods. Dan? Going, going, gone. Dan's out. <laughs> Still got a chance. Virginia Rodriguez? Rodriguez interjects community and government something. Oh, Virginia's not here either. Virginia? Oh, no luck. Yeah, we're going to be here all day. Julian Baker. There's Julian here. Got to be in the room, apparently. Wouldn't be fair if I was more patient with Julian than I was with everybody else. Julian, going, gone. Sorry, Julian. Jeez, I didn't think I was going to get this much mic time. Colleen Manson? Ah, sorry. <laughs> oh, for sure? OK. You're just going to keep saying no till I get you, Melissa. Megan Armstrong. Megan Armstrong. All right, thank you so much, Booker. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our final panel coming up on stage. Um, Joining us as the moderator of this panel is Amanda Monroe. She's the partner at Monroe Thompson Communications. We're so pleased that Amanda was able to help us out and put this panel together, and uh, we're really excited to have this one. With that, I'm going to invite Amanda up to introduce the panelists and uh, the topic. Uh, the panel is titled, ISCOM Investments, Self-Directed Consortium of 20-plus First Nations Building a Sustainable Future in the Forest Sector. So let's give a hand for Amanda and all of our panelists. Good afternoon. Hello. Thanks, everyone, for still sticking around. How's lunch? Thumbs up. Awesome. Everyone's full. Oh, hand for the catering team. Um, thanks so much, Logan. And just uh, as Logan mentioned, my name is Amanda Monroe. I'm a partner at Monroe Thompson Communications. Um, we have the pleasure of working with Indigenous nations and communities across British Columbia to really help them share their story, whatever that looks like on their journey to self-determination and, and uh, building reconciliation. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panel we have here today. Um, I mean, the gentleman on the very end needs no introduction, but Mr. Dallas Smith sitting on the other end of the, the stage today. Uh, John Jack, who I think a lot of you have had the pleasure of listening to last night, uh, Chief Counselor of Hawaii First Nations. Brenna Robinson from Lyaxon First Nation is a, is a counselor. And then this gentleman next to me is uh, Mr. Robert Dennis, a uh, former chief counselor, long time of Hawaii First Nations, and the chair of ISKIM Investments. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, 
So what are we talking about? Uh, this is ISKIM Investments was launched a few weeks ago. Um, if you haven't heard about them, you're going to hear a lot about them today. So thanks uh, for IROC for having us here. Uh, no, it's a partnership of over 20 First Nations on Vancouver Island and the BC coast that co have come together to pursue economic opportunities of scale that they can't, but they couldn't potentially do on their own. But as a group, um, you know, ama amazing things can happen. So we're going to hear about that today. Um, and then, yeah, so we're going to hear about, I guess, what the, uh, why they come together, their experience in establishing this partnership, governance, and the vision for the future. So here we are. Why don't we get Mr. Robert Dennis, Mr. Dennis, to kiss, kick us off here. So, Robert, can you, uh, oh, actually, before we get started, if anyone was at the Kofi conference a few weeks ago, uh, Leonard Joe from the BC First Nations Forestry Council commented on ISCOM um, about bringing together 20 First Nations being a notable achievement. Uh, he said something along the lines of, it's hard to get three nations in a room together, let alone to agree on something. So to see, to see this happening is really an achievement. So Robert, why don't we start off, can you share with us what is ISCOM and why was it formed? Good, is it on? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, ISCOM is, is actually, the name itself, uh, for those of us that uh, knew that there was a trading language in British Columbia, the Chinook language, and ISCOM comes from that Chinook language to take hold of. And um, so we thought an appropriate name to, you know, uh, to, to name our, our new company, as you as, as you mentioned, we launched it. Uh, I look at it, it's the beginning. You know, the, the, the 20 or so of us got together, and I'm actually confident that it's going to be more in a little while because I'm starting to gather cards. Can we meet? And uh, so, so that, that's the good thing. And then the second thing, the ability to stay together. And, and to strive to achieve the goals that we, we you know, uh, set, set, set out in our plans or in our, our strategic approach to, to achieve economic reconciliation. And, and for me, um, I do look at economic reconciliation in a different perspective than most people. And one of them is um, Chief John Jack. I got an opportunity to fish with his father, grandfather, sorry. And I seen an economically independent Poet person. So fishing three seasons with him, I got to ask him a lot of questions about you know, why he's doing this. And I remember there was one big issue that came out when they were changing the licensing system in, in Canada for, for, for the coastal salmon fishery. They introduced the licensing system for, there'd be an A, a license, basically that was for the, the race-based whites. <laughs> and then there was an AI, an A license for the Indian. And the, the A license was, would cost you more. And the A license was, was much cheaper. And I remember I said to, to Ernie, I said, well, well, how come you're gonna buy an A license? He says, well, I wanna invest in the industry. He said, when I get out of the industry, I don't want two dollars, I want twenty. Ah. That that hit me. And so so this is this is the why now. I think as First Nations, we're willing to look at economic development in a different perspective. Uh, a speaker before us talked about the colonial mind. We're so colonized that we think a certain way. We think that that uh, government has to do everything for us. And uh, I think when we say get out of that colonized mind, you know, why don't we invest? We, First Nations, why don't we invest in something and do something and make it work? Work, you know, working together. I've heard that phrase so much, this conference. I think that's the theme that, that you know, it, that, that has hit this. And Dallas, I thank you for having that that wisdom to you know to come up with that, you know what do they call it the the brand for the conference? I think it was it was a wonderful because working together gives us a better chance to achieve more. And you know having coming from the forest industry and the fishing sector, the one thing that that I noticed most was uh, 
there wasn't too much of the willingness to work together to achieve the benefit for, for the parties involved. It was, you know, a liberal government would get in and they would be supporting industry because, you know, they're the ones that needed help and they would be fighting against the union. Nobody was working together. They were, they were all fighting. And so for me, sitting back the last few years, so maybe there's a time for change. Maybe we, we don't have to fight to achieve our, our end goals that, that we all want. Maybe it's better if we do work together so that we can end up achieving each of our objectives. And when I look at it, you know, uh, for, for government, if, if industry is working together, you know, the revenues for, for the government keep coming in. If uh, industry is there involved, you know, they, they keep getting their money to, to operate their, their businesses. The union workers, uh, they will continue to work and take home more pay. Contractors will be able to, to do their work and get there. And then First Nations, we take something home too. And that, to me, that's what economic reconciliation is all about. And I heard it today, getting our fair share of the pie. We have not, as First Nations, been getting a fair share. So we're going to start getting our fair share the way everybody else does. You know, we're, we're going to get involved in business, and uh, we're going to take hold of our own destiny. And we're going to be the driving the bus for economic reconciliation, is what I like to say. You know, we want to be the leaders. We're going to change things. But at the end of the day, we're all going to benefit. And that's, that's what, what, you know, why I, I at least you know, looked at the uh, formation of ISCOM. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and you're talking about the, the significance of uh, this change that needs to happen and the nations are coming together. So I'd like to hear from the panelists moving down the line here. You know, Brenna, why did Lyaxon come about to start participating with uh, ISCOM? Okay. Hi, Siepka, Siem Nasieya, Nishkwalakwa, and Selkwen. Uh, Lyaxon, uh, for those of you that don't know where Lyaxon is, uh, we have a small community now of around about 220 members. We're part of the larger Cowitsa Nation, which is Couch and Tribes, Halalt, Penelikid, and Stamanis First Nations. And we have always believed in collaboration. We believed in working together. We believe we're, you, as a united front, we are so much stronger than we are individually. And it's not about the size of the nations, it's about the number of nations. And ISCOM, as you've heard, has over 20 First Nations that have committed to it so far. We're hoping to expand upon that. Uh, but wanted to just say, um, so two fundamental teachings uh, that my elders have passed down is not so much Gwalawin, working together as one with a good heart, a good mind, and a good spirit. And another teaching is Sitsawatl, taking care of one another. And you think about those two teachings, and you try to live by them every single day, every hour, every minute. I can tell you I've tried, and I never make it through one day. Not one day. Um, and it's, today's day is, is really different. And, and like Robert said, the time has changed. And we do need to come together. We do need to come as a united front. We need industry to start taking us seriously. We need the governments to start taking us seriously. We know that we're a hot commodity. And we have, we <laughs> just on the fact that we're indigenous and with UNDRIP recognized around the world, we could be entering global markets as long as we come together to work together. And it's kind of like the, the teachings of our big houses, right? We all know what to do when there's a funeral in the community. We all know how to come together to support one another. We all know that when we go into the big house that there's that invisible hook there where we're gonna leave all of our negative feelings behind and come in and do the work and do it in a good way. And that's what I see in ISCOM is when we come into that boardroom, there's that invisible hook there we're going to leave all that negativity in the back, and we're just going to come together and work together in a really good way to get stuff done. Because it's not just about us, it's about our future generations and making sure that they're able to follow their dreams. Some of the panelists before me talking about, you know, opportunities for women 
to see themselves in roles that are predominantly like occupied by men. And that's what industry is. It's a male dominated bunch of the, all of the industries. And I'm hopeful that ISTEM will change that and especially for our indigenous women and allow them to have the space to reconnect with the land and take back our leadership. Hi, Chika. Thanks, Brenna. Um, I wanted to ask a question for Chief Jack now. Moving, moving forward, you know, people are likely asking, how is it possible these nations can come together? So Chief Jack, you know, what is the, what is, how is the collaboration working here? How's the governance working with a group like this? So building on the idea that we are coming together because each of our nations have our own activities that are very heavily based in forestry and the resource industry. And because we're so involved in what we're doing on our own land, there's a degree of value there. Uh, because I think this is sometimes lost, we always often think of nature as somehow different from who we are. And there's a saying I always say in local government circles, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. And the idea here is that there's an adverse to that. There's a good version of that and that you are not somehow separate from nature. Despite our surroundings, we are in nature now. We are a part of the systems and that we should have some confidence in that as well. We have the knowledge, we have the know-how and combined with the modern techniques, these are things that can create value. There's, there's a limitation there. And I think this is something that really provides the incentive for First Nations to work together. The limitation is that our nations are quite small. Our nations are quite remote. Our nations have a certain cap in, in both their reach and maybe their grasp. But if we work together and build on all of the things we've done in our own territories, learn from one another, suddenly that reach gets a little far. Suddenly that, re that grasp gets a little harder and we can achieve more. And I think that's the fundamental thing that really makes it a compelling choice for Hawaii because we are quite invested in forestry. We're, we're involved with Western Forest Products in Sawakin and it's going very well. We're having great conversations with Mosaic and it's going very well. We have to maybe think about how does forestry operate actually in terms of the globe? How, does, how do we compete in a global market? And how do we work together to create value for coastal forestry? And that means cooperation. And in order to demonstrate that level of cooperation, we have to work together and show how we're working together. So I think one thing that's really important that we've talked about very early with ISCOM is that, thank you for turning me up, um, is, is that no one nation has any more say than another. And that was a fundamental core agreement at the very beginning because it wasn't about whether or not one nation could benefit more or less based on how much they invested or whatever, maybe later, but right now, together. Because there's, there's, a, there's a reason that we're moving forward in the way that we're moving forward. Because it's, it's demonstrated respect for one another, but also demonstrated confidence in forestry. Because that's the one thing we all seem to have in common. So that's, for me, one of the most compelling reasons why we're getting involved. And it feels like the time is right. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, John. I think we're gonna go to Dallas there next. Dallas, John talked about the forest sector. Uh, your nations as well, the now coast nations are involved in forestry. A lot of folks are talking about that. What makes ISCOM different? What is the vision for the forest sector that ISCOM can provide? I'm not gonna lie, the control freak anxieties of me of not moderating for the first time in a couple days is catching up to me a little bit, but. <laughs> I think that's a great question, you know, all along, you know, first I got to thank Robert Dennis in his capacity of Chiefs Counselor before my good friend John um, succeeded him. But Huayat and Numakols have been having this discussion for the better part of a decade now. We met together lobbying Premier Campbell for these exact opportunities that our nations have so proudly developed over the years. And we just talked about what is the art of the possible. Getting a tenure in your hand that gives you the opportunity to manage resources within your own territory almost is a little bit ironic, but the ability to stretch our hands together up and down the island 
has brought us back to the way we traditionally worked with each other. There's three different main language groups with subset dialects and whatnot on Vancouver Island, but if we didn't respect each other's autonomy, there would be one language group on Vancouver Island. But we respected each other's autonomy, but also respected the working and trade relationship that we used to have. And so everybody talks about working together. Let's all work together and make a difference. Let's all do it because it sounds what is right. Nunwako has found a willing partner in Huayit to help us bring in other nations to realize that this is simply one piece of the machinery. We talk about the downstream economic opportunities that exist in forestry. We talk about the need for export. We talk about the need for a balanced approach to how we continue to manage these resources going forward. And it was so important for our nations not only to get this deal done for the livelihoods and security of our communities, but it would be irresponsible of us not to look at what those next steps look like. And I think that's a prime example of ISCOM is the fact that we've not only taken the burden to hand, we've figured out how we can grow that and how we can continue to invest in each other's to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And I think just one piece that pulls us together, I'm feeling like if Robert and I were talking about the the helpfulness of naps when you start early days and I was feeling a little bit cold as I finished my lunch, but this is a fitting piece that was done by my nephew slash brother, Curtis Wilson. And he had this view of Canada that it all fit. And that's the approach that all of our nations, the 20 plus nations that are getting involved in this game changing, community changing opportunity is approaching it is, is we all fit. Thanks, Alice. Now I'm hearing, you know, working together, um, Robert, you talked about economic reconciliation. How is ISCOM, it's a self-directed consortium of nations. How is ISCOM set up to achieve economic reconciliation in ways that maybe other initiatives haven't so far? The, the first place I'd like to start is that at my homeland, <coughs> one of our, our what, our, our hereditary chiefs got up and, and said, you know, I think it's time that we looked at doing business outside of our territory. And I was very intrigued by that. It, it, it stuck with me. I don't know if you remember that discussion. Yasuo was the one that brought that up. And that always stayed in my mind that, you know, we don't only have to just work in our backyard. And, and when I seen the three uh, nations in Vancouver uh, Musqueam, Poyotooth, and uh, Squamish. Three nations getting together to do a development. And I thought, wow, what if, what if we could do something in that, something like that? And lo and behold, you know, we started getting together. And, and, and one thing that I found out was how closely we were aligned on economic development, how closely we aligned we were on stewardship how closely we were aligned on creating jobs for our people, how closely we were aligned, aligned on benefiting for all British Columbia. So to me, that, that is part of the, that economic reconciliation formula. It's not just for one group, it's, it's for all of us. And, and I'll, I'll say it again, that you know, the workers deserve just to work and take as, you know, a good living income home as an executive member of a major company. And, uh, and the First Nation has the right to, to earn, earn some revenue so that they can provide programs and services for their people, because that's just what we have to do. So that's how I look at economic reconciliation. Others, other of us have different formulas, but, but we know, and John and Dallas, we know that our people are the last people hired, right? And uh, guaranteed, probably the first ones let go. And uh, you know, we want to change that. And we can change that by, by working together and, and being committed to, to you know, to, to uh, providing, uh, you know, income opportunities for all of us so that we all get a, a fair share of the pie. And I think that's meaningful reconciliation from, from an economic perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, from an economic perspective, going, thinking about business, this one for Brenna here, 
we talk about kind of an indigenous lens. So what does an indigenous lens on business look like for your perspective? Thanks. Uh, so for, for me, for an indigenous lens is about thinking about more than just today. It's about thinking about tomorrow. We hear the seven generations, but it's really important that we really start looking at it now. BC has seen the devastation that's been happening with the, the vast difference in climate changes that have happened throughout the province over the last couple of years with all the flash flooding, uh, the fires, uh, the wind storms, all of it. Um, and it's really important uh, that we start looking at these things and understanding a little bit better on how we are impacting our environment. I can say for one, number one thing I think about in my everyday life is around the anchorages. I think about them and seeing them, you know, out surrounding our island. Um, they didn't used to be there seven years ago, ten years ago. Uh, there'd be maybe one every once in a while, and now there's like seven of them that are right out front of Shingle Point in front of our War Chief Village site every single day, constantly. And why are they there, right? Because they're coming in from around the world. So thinking about where we're doing our business, where we're purchasing things from, how we're acquiring things. Um, so, you know, one of the things, I can't shop off Amazon anymore because I just, I'm trying to make sure that I'm starting to really support BC, support BC entrepreneurs, support BC businesses. And that's one of the things that we can do. And looking at, for us, everything is interconnected right? The earth is connected. You can't talk about land without talking about the water, without talking about the air, without talking about the subsurface. It's all interconnected. And understanding how our practices impact all the different habitats, whether it's our wildlife and our food sources. You know, I think my grandma used to have that poster, and some of you have probably seen it. It's an indigenous woman, and she's standing on a rock. And it says something like, only after the last tree has been cut down, the last river has been poisoned, the last fish has been caught, then we will realize that money can't be eaten. And my grandma had that poster hanging in her room or hanging in her dining room like 40 years ago and it's, it stayed there. And I used to look at that poster and think like, oh, what does that really mean, you know, growing up? And so uh, as an elected counselor for my nation, it's a real reality that we're facing and thinking about my, I don't, I'm not blessed to have grandchildren, so my unborn grandchildren, but thinking about them and thinking about what are we doing? What are we leaving for them? And how are we going to be able to leave a future for them that is bright and um, sustainable and ensuring that they do have wild salmon to eat? Um, you know. Our community is lucky if we get food fish now once every four years. Uh, so those, it's a real important thing that's happening and forestry practices are, are really important to a lot of our food sources. Um, so it, it does make sense and on our island, uh, Mosaic is there, we do have a relationship with them, but we do have a Douglas fir forest there. And even here in BC, you know, people don't think about it. We're a rainforest. There's lots of medicines that are in our rainforest that we need to think about as well, on top of the animals and on top of all the, the sea animals and whatnot. But um, that's what I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do through ISCOM is, is be able to bring that Indigenous perspective in where we'll still be able to make some profit and make a difference, but also really make a difference for the planet and to ensure future generations are able to enjoy some of the privileges that we have today. Thanks, Brenna. Um, John, this next question here from you. I heard Brenna said, you know, supporting BC business uh, from an indigenous perspective, we're talking about locally, First Nations economy, how is ISKIM, what is your vision for how ISKIM is set up to support the provincial economy, the Canadian economy? What does that look like? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. I think, I think some of the things that are important when we're talking about the Crown governments, the province and the federal government, 
like they all have these plans that are centered around uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. They have uh, very high intentions when it comes to uh, reconciliation. And so what we are primarily focused on in terms of reconciliation has to do with self-determination, self-reliance, making sure that we're focusing very specifically on making sure that we can get our people to build the lives they want to live rather than the ones they feel like they're stuck in. And so what I'm happy to see are when they put their money where their mouth is, right? When the federal government announces, I think it's $9, million or $9 billion for the uh, loan guarantees or the same thing for the province, $1 billion in their industrial framework or guidelines. They, anyway, it was recently released. It, those are really good things. Um, we can look at reinvestment and revitalizing relationships, but I think from my perspective, being the person who may not ever really fully understand science or indigenous science or all of those systems and how they interact, one thing I do understand is how decisions get made. And I promise I'm going somewhere with this. So, so. Um, but if we think about the way decisions get made in our country and in our province, think of them in terms of being adversarial fundamentally. Right? You have the government and the opposition. And the decisions don't get made in the legislature, nor in the cabinet. They just get finalized and implemented at that level. Decisions get made in political parties. And political parties are made up of factions under the big tents. If we want to have any sort of influence on how decisions get made using that established system, we'd have to be embedded in each of the political parties to kind of go, hey guys, maybe you should think about this more holistically. But if you think of the different factions and the different political parties, federally or provincially, they're all the all or nothing guys. You, do you really think that the latte sipping university students of one wing of the NDP are really getting along with the union guys of the NDP? Do you really think the social conservatives are gonna have the same level of understanding of business as the, as the business wing? They're, democ they're democracies, so you carry the day with votes. How many people actually go to these conventions? How many, how many decisions actually get made in a way that we think it does? It doesn't, it happens within those parties. And I can understand that, I know how the numbers work. You can predict it, you can base your whole career on predicting and talking about how that all works. It's like sports, way, way tedious, very tedious, infuriating, intimidating, but consequential. And then we start thinking about the things that Robert was trying to teach me coming up as a, as, a, as a member of council. We don't make decisions in indigenous communities that way. It's not all or nothing. It's not 50% plus one. It's consensus. It's tedious. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's consequential, but it's different. So how indigenous communities make decisions is fundamentally different than how it works in our democracies and in how the cards are being played in our democracies. And so if we can start embedding ourselves in places where we can help focus those warring factions within each of those parties, then we don't always have to worry about making as much use as possible out of the business cycle because the business cycle doesn't always follow the 10 year trends of liberal conservative, liberal conservative, liberal conservative. It feels like often our business cycles do not line up with the political cycles. And we've been bearing the, the consequences of that for probably two generations. So maybe we start thinking about making decisions differently, the way that Robert has always wanted me to think them. And maybe that will bear fruit not just politically, but maybe in corporate governance as well. Um, I'll leave it at that. I know I just took way too much time. Thank you. Uh, any follow-up to that? Dallas, I see you nodding. Anything to add to that? Not really, but I'll talk for a couple minutes anyway. Um, I think just taking that to a different level, I mean, those of us are trying to get involved in mainstream politics, and I'll use my quote unquote because you know we come from communities that have some of these factions they're called families 
And so being able to navigate those paths within a community should better prepare some of our people to join. And it doesn't matter what party. I joined the BC Liberal Party for the 2017 run because I wanted to change how they did policy that reflected on my people. I wanted to gain bigger tools to solve some of the problems that we faced on Vancouver Island and adjacent places. But I think what you're seeing with ISCOM is it's almost artificial learning on the fly. We've taken from some of the heartaches that we've all had individually as communities and we've realized that we need to, it's almost like the hook at the big house, you know, some of the challenges we've had amongst each other as nations, we've realized in the big picture don't really matter if our people are still starving. And that's one of the other interesting things about ISCOM is if we're looking to build a big company that's gonna have a strong value so it can bring in the investment from the outside world, and we know that people need to have a return on that investment, but for us, that return goes into elders programs. It goes into youth programs. It goes into stewardship programs, like my niece Alexandra is starting to run on behalf of our nations. And so it's a bit of a different mindset. And it's, it's amazing how, you know, Chief Robert Dennis has been so influential to all of us in just helping us see something that's already been in front of us. You know, when you bring 20 nations together, everybody's got to have it out a little bit. There's a couple shots that are taken. There's a couple of these things. But the ability of our leadership group at ISCOM to be able to diffuse those discussions to keep the focus on where it needs to be, I think is going to be a learning example. And um, I really look forward to taking the model that we've developed to look into resource industries to look at many different resource industries. I don't think forestry is the be all end all of ISCOM at the end of the day. I think when we bring an organized group with the investing power that the 20 of us bring to the table, it would be irresponsible of us for us to just stop at forestry. I think you uh, set us up for this question, Dallas, that's right here, which is uh, from the crowd. Do you see ISKIM expanding into different industries? And if yes, which ones? Robert. Oh, you want Dal yeah, over Dallas? Well, I, I think really all the industries that we share up and down the island is the example that we use right now because that's where I believe 99% of our, of our partnership is involved in. And so I think, you know, Larry Johnson gave a great presentation this morning on the role of fisheries. And the Nuchanos nations came together to talk about how can we integrate our values, our investment opportunities, and they realized that the best way to do that was to buy St. Jean's. And so I think that's a prime example of where we can continue to take what smaller groups have been successful, but look at larger groups and using that buying power. And I think of my good friend, Chief Terry Paul from the Mi'kmaq, from Member Two First Nation on the East Coast, where they had all these problems with the lobster fishery, where they fit in it, where they managed it. They just went out and got some partners and bought it. And I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, obviously, because a lot of people like your company and other people's have done some great work in helping them do that. But I think we need to learn to start dreaming bigger again. I know, you know, Chief Jack mentioned about his dreams being a product of his reality last night, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But I think it's, you know, it's up to us as leaders to provide that vision and opportunity for our people to grow into across the spectrum. Yeah, and just to add on, um, and I jokingly said this, but I was actually true at, at one of our board meetings where, you know, I see ISCOM as a brand that we can move forward with. And um, and someone here at the conference earlier, I can't remember if it was today or yesterday, made the joke about the hotel. And that was exactly what I said, is I said, what about us? You know, I could see us starting up our own chain of hotels, you know, calling them the ISCOM. We could be the new Hyatt. We could become ISCOM and we could start spanning out globally. We could be connecting with other indigenous communities around the world and helping them develop their own hotel brands and being in partnership with them. Um, you know, it's a dream, but whether or not it's going to become a reality, I don't know. But it's, that's just part of the things that I, I think about when, 
when we're looking at things, you know, trying to find a decent hotel to stay in in all of our small communities. And then being able to actually have one that's owned by, by the nations, I, I think it's a huge opportunity, especially in the tourism industry. Um, so those are things that we, we do think about, uh, but really the sky's the limit, I think. John? Yeah, I'm, I think at some point in the future, the sky is the limit for sure. And I think the one commonality we've all answered in, these, uh, uh, in the response to this top question, they're all rooted in, in our presence on the land. And I think that's, that's where we're going to start primarily. So applications of presence on the land, activities on the land, becoming more Hawaiian by having a relationship with Hawaiian territory. So that's that idea that the, the land isn't the land until Hawaiian people are on it, and Hawaiian people aren't Hawaiian people until we're on the land, at least in a meaningful way. And I think, I think the same can be said for a lot of our communities uh, and our friends and relatives across the island and across the coast. And I think we'll probably start there, but depending on how quickly things go, and I think this is gonna kind of go into the, the second or third question, is there are decisions that are being made by the provincial and federal government now that potentially increase our reach and grasp. And I think that makes things exciting for what we may be able to do with partners and what we may be able to do with uh, other, other types of endeavors as well, but that, that bears investigation, thank you. What is the provincial and federal government doing? Oh. Okay, so I think I said this already, but the, the federal government just uh, in their budget, and regardless of what you think of the budget, this is actually pretty good for, from my perspective, is that there's $9 billion for an, a loan guarantee for indigenous communities, which I think applied across Canada isn't as huge as I'd love it to be, but it's still something. And it is something that allows for us to increase that reach and potentially use some of funding to increase our grasp in looking at these opportunities in real ways and demonstrate that not only we have confidence in these industries, but we're confident that we can provide value as well, which will have an impact on the market, I think. And all those things need to work together in order for any of this to work. So that's what's exciting. And the province is doing something similar. Uh, it's in their, I wrote it down, industrial blueprint. So if you put BC Government Industrial Blueprint, PDF, um, on one of the pages around Indigenous reconciliation, they did earmark $1 billion for a similar framework of, I think, a loan guarantee, which can expand the capacity for First Nations to be involved in these things in ways that are perhaps much further beyond just going into debt, but actually getting involved in a larger scale and scope, which is where value is often created nowadays. Thanks. Thank you, John. Yeah, I think we have to ask this next question. People are dying to know. So how will ISCOM decide what to invest? What to invest in and how will it go? John, go for it. I wanted some form of boxing, but it's going to be, <laughs> it's gonna be more arm wrestling apparently. But, oh yeah, that too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I really do think it's going to start where, where investments start in, in other organizations and other individuals with what we have access to, what we're familiar with, and where we're confident we can add value. I think that's the conversation that we need to have. And as I said before, it's going to be intimidating at times, tedious a lot of the time, but ultimately consequential. We're going to be thinking in terms of consensus building understanding each other, moving forward together. And I think that process will bear fruit because we will increase the base level of confidence in what we're doing together. And we'll be able to demonstrate that to the market, to the government, and the onlookers. And I think those things can really matter when we start moving into actually making moves and making real decisions. Thanks. Thanks, John. Now, we only have a few minutes left. I have a clock next to me doing my role as moderator. There is one question I do want to ask, and for anyone on the panel, is why is now the right time for the consortium like ISCOM? You know, we're 2024. We've talked about the history and the histories we all have as nations. What, what were the conditions that made it possible today? 
just for me really quickly as a chair, you know, having worked with Dallas and John and other First Nations, Chris, you know, looking at the capacity that they have, the time in line. <laughs> what took us so long? Yeah, I mean, my, my answer was because we didn't do it yesterday is yeah. sort of the thinking. You know, it's one thing, like I said, to conceptualize, well, you know, we should do this and maybe we'll do this and we'll do this, but we have energetic young leaders who aren't afraid of doing something different and breaking that barrier. But the capacities that we built, I think of, you know, people like, well, he's, he's retired, so it's a bad example, but Rob Botterill, who's helped us, you know, form the coalition, the, the, the group, the, the, the consortium that's come together. But we have people like Ted Nash, who's given their experience from the provincial government. And so each of our nations has a different skill set that we've been able to bring to the table to really make this cohesive. Like I said, it's one thing to get 20 chiefs in a room and get them to agree on some principles, but we have some long-term goals with some very clear steps along the way that we've all drinking the Kool-Aid on. And it's taken years to get us to this point, but we can't wait for tomorrow. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this now is to make it so we're in that position that the next generation of leadership that comes behind us has it in hand. It's not something they're worried about the grasp or the reach. It's actually something that's in front of them. And that's where the discussions around other industries and other opportunities come in. We need to see this very challenging opportunity through on the forest industry so it can put us in a position to invest in what the future of mining looks like with precious metals and the need for certain things like that. So I, I really think there's some strategic steps that the past has prepared us for today. John. I think, I think this has been building since the 60s, honestly. Do you see uh, the political awakening in political leaders in the 60s and 70s? You see things like the formation of, at least on the West Coast, the, the West Coast District Council. You see these huge giants that are leaders, like George Watts and others, uh, Art Peters, moving forward and building on the court cases that were settled as time goes through. So we get into the 70s and the 80s, you start to realize that with indigenous communities have rights and title. And at a certain point, you realize that, hey, it's great that we're able to stop the bad things from happening, but that's only half the, half the problem. How do you make the good things happen? What, what, is, what are the considerations that we need to have in order to make sure that, hey, the economy has to work a certain way. And I think that's the next step that we're taking now is understanding that there's a degree of balance and harmony and working together in order to make it work. It's not enough to celebrate stopping the bad exploitation from happening. That's like a third of it. Now we have to think on how do things actually work? What's wrong with that and how do we make it better? What are, what are the tools we bring to the table? What are the techniques we, we bring to use those tools to create value, potentially out of things that were not thought of or not seemed possible? And that's why I think it's so valuable now because we're all starting to crystallize around the situation that can be boiled down to, no one's going anywhere. How do we live together? And it's tedious, it's intimidating, and it's consequential. <laughs> but we're doing it. So let's start showing people that we're doing it because I think it's a really great story to tell. Thanks. And we are at time, but I wanted to give the last word to Brenna. <laughs> Thanks. For the time is now, it, we have 20, over 20 First Nations that have committed and are dedicated to working together to make a difference. And not just make a difference for us and for our communities, but really make a difference in the province and for the benefit of this country. And the other thing that we didn't talk about a little bit is, is the opportunity of coming together is, as they said, we have different capacities. We're always competing for the same talent if we were doing this alone. So by doing it together, we're not in competition with one another and we're able to utilize that talent to make ISCOM the strongest that we possibly can by pulling our resources and, and really it's about making the difference. And there's no better time than now. 
we are making it, uh, I mean, it may be look, making it look a little bit easier, but we're standing on the, you know, on the shoulders of giants, right? Um, and so that's, that's what we really want you to understand is, is that we're serious, we, we want to make a difference, and that we're united. And that's really what's important. So, hi, Siapka, CM. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brenna. I'll hand it over to Logan, but uh, thanks so much, and thanks to IROC for having me, and thanks Dallas for switching ends of the stage and taking a different role. And um, I think there's way more to come with ISCOM. There, you can check out the website, iscom.ca, slight plug. I'm sure there's gonna be lots more information, so if you're curious of what's happening, or if you saw questions about investment and what's next, you can follow them along there. Thanks so much. Well, Thank you so much, Amanda, and to all of our panelists. Um, please, just on behalf of IROC and Nan McCullis, accept these small gifts. We just have a couple more messages, and I'm going to make sure Dallas gets the final word on stage. So if you all don't mind hanging out for two more minutes, we'd really appreciate it. All right, while they uh, take this final photo, just a few thank yous on behalf of IROC. Um, first, just the amazing team here at VICC and SW Events who've been doing our AV. Let's give them a massive round of applause for making all of this happen. Uh, also, a big thank you to Hummingbird Event Productions for providing this beautiful stage and all the decor, the centerpieces. Uh, they've really made this room feel so welcoming, and it's been fantastic to have the setup like this. So let's give them a round of applause as well. Uh, a big thank you to the organizing team at C3 Alliance. Uh, these are the folks that you've been phoning, emailing. You've seen them at the registration desk. So I'm going to read their names out uh, just so that we can all give them the proper recognition that they deserve. Melissa McRitchie, Kenzie Stufko, Brona Furlong, Brian Picardo, John Dunphy, Brandy Butler, Emily Milne, Sarah Weber, and Dan Jepson. Thank you all so much for making this possible. And thank you to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying so long. It's been a fantastic three days, and uh, I know Dallas really appreciates it. We really appreciate it. So let's give yourselves a round of applause as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dallas. Dallas, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for, for creating this event and for leading this event. It's been fantastic. I know you want the last word, so I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you so much. So, I've got to explain the shirt. I don't know if people can see it and it's getting done justice, but it's a very powerful, what I believe to be a Cree warrior flying or riding a very beautiful horse with an eagle beside him saying, City of Campbell River, Canada. <laughs> Apparently one of the major industry players who might be in this room thought this would be an appropriate gift for a First Nations leader, but I'm just messing with you guys. I, I wear this with happiness because it helps to show how far we've truly come. I stand here today just overwhelmed, overwhelmed at the generosity of our sponsors, of the patrons. Sorry, I was watching the Augusta, Augusta National of the Masters and they call all the audience patrons. So I think that's something we'll adopt at IROC is our patrons have given us one of the most important things that we can get is your time. You've given us your time to share some stories that need to be shared. And the network just keeps growing. I talked about in 2009 when we had the first event, and there were 60 people here. 
I think 15 of them were staff members from the two respective organizations who helped create it, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. We went through COVID where we had to do this online, and we just kept growing and finding a way to persevere, and that's the story of Indigenous reconciliation. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to find people to listen, but you still have to have that voice. And while you guys all know I could do this all afternoon, I just want to acknowledge again C3 and the team that have helped us put this together into what's becoming a world-class event when it comes to sharing Indigenous stories. We've actually moved the dial on how people look at the role of First Nations in the role of management of their territories. None of us are pigeonholed into, are you a developer or are you a protector? We don't have that luxury. Our responsibility and accountability to our lands and resources that defines our rights and title that has been showed as a symbol through the Council of the Haida Nation. That's what it's really about. And we need to continue this dialogue to take that fear away from it. Because if we're not putting it out clearly what it is, what it's going to lead to, other people are going to put their definitions of what that is in front of us. Too many of our people have carried the burden of other people's definitions. Whether it's John Rustad, Kevin Falcon, anybody else who is trying to fearmonger people into the reconciliation process that this province and country has been under for 30 years. If you want to have a chat about that, you come to this forum and you talk to us. Okay, look, what's up? All right, thank you everybody. Please get home safe. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next year at IROC. Uh, I hope we all see you at BCNRF in January, IROC Sister Conference. That's January 14th to 16th. And I believe IROC is coming up uh, June 18th to 20th, 2025. So we look forward to seeing you all next year. Have a great, safe trip home. Thank you.